Gilbert Gottfried. Oh, Our boy. guest this week <laughs> is an actor. Yeah. Well, oh, that, wait, let me cross that off. Yeah, right. Our <laughs> guest this week is an actor, writer, best selling author, and one of the most popular and influential stand up comedians of the last 40 years. He's what about a, 41, 42 uh, years? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, that that's this must be next week's guest. Ah, he's been in hit movies like Fame, Scarface, Fletch Lives, Man on the Moon, and The Groove Tube, and on dozens of TV shows, including Saturday Night Live, Moonlighting, Lois and Clark, Mad About You, Thirty Rock, and South Park. For 21 years, he played the cynical and acerbic police detective John Munch on nine different series of one of... What? Eleven. On eleven <laughs> different series. Eleven different series, making him the longest running character in the history of primetime television. But of course, he'll always be known for his legendary work as one of my fellow recurring cast members on the enduring late night classic. Thick of the night. Mama, don't turn the light out. Wait, 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 let's start. What? On the count of three. My voice is a little hoarse. There's nothing I can do. <laughs> What's the difference when it's not? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. On the count of three. One, okay, two, Gilbert, three. General Godfrey. Yeah. Mama, do need the lady. I'm in the room tonight. Mama, do need it. What was the other song? Wasn't there two themes? That's that's what I Who remember. Who that Jew in back of you? The, oh. Now you're springing all these Jews on me, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the guy with the Boston hat? Yes. That's, 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 Boston? that's Neil. He's making a documentary about Rich, about Gilbert, Richard. Oh, hi, Neil. Now, now uh, Richard. When... Nice talking to you, Neil. <clears throat> okay, thank you. <laughs> now, yeah, Richard. I'm sorry, go ahead, Speaking of anti-Semitism... Yeah, ask me if I'm a Jewish. Yes. Are you Jewish? <laughs> Jewish. Anyway. <laughs> now, oh, see, I fucked up the punchline. That's line. I fucked it up, too. It's asking no, me if I'm a Jew. let's start all over let's again. Let's start over. Ask me uh, if I'm a yeah. Jew. Okay. Richard, are you a Jew? Jewish. Can you tell me... Yes. Uh, can you tell the audience, rather? Sorry, tell, tell the audience... Uh, what, how we met? Oh, well, I think you were 19 years old, and I was the MC at Catch a Rising Star, and that would be, what, 74, Gil? Something yeah, like it, was, that. it was early 70s, yeah. Right, and uh, Rick Newman, the owner of Catch, said, uh, you got to see this kid, he's great, he does impressions. And I said, sure, and I put you on... And I remember you did, you were really funny. Uh, you did uh, the Three Stooges and Beethoven, right? Remember? And, oh, yeah. Uh, wow, well, I don't know that do bit. It. Yeah, well, why throw them out? <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so I'm still doing Eisenhower jacket jokes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, no, that's where we met. And, um, God, you know, you came, started coming in almost every night. And became a fixture. And I remember in the early day, well, up until we stopped going there, whenever Gilbert was on, all the comedians would rush out of the bar to see him. So one of those rare comics that the comics dug and also the audiences. Sometimes comics, you know, uh, uh, only other, other comics like them, present company excluded. But um, Gilbert, uh, you know, met the needs of the audience, but also on some level, really struck a chord in other comedians because he was so different and daring, and yet he respected the form in his own bizarre way. Yeah, I and and he was found dead today in his New York apartment. 
<laughs> yeah. Face down yes. in a bowl of Cheerios. Yes. <laughs> Neighbors were complaining about the stench. Right. I mean, it, from it, was, the it wasn't him, the stench. It was <laughs> no, but I, I... Was that a eulogy or no? Yeah, I, I remember... What do you, you remember about that, it? That I... I used to like go on stage and I would imitate Jerry Seinfeld <laughs> and he was like un- totally unknown at the time. Yeah, and he was imitating Larry David. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you're going for a generation. <laughs> but I would I would do a Jerry Seinfeld imitation. For instance. And and I remember it was like the so the audience and the other comedians would all run in, the bartenders uh, and waitresses would be laughing hysterically in the back when I was imitating Seinfeld. And Seinfeld would get pissed off, and he'd (laughs) stay in the bar pacing back and forth going, Ah. That doesn't sound anything like me. (laughs) Why does he make me sound like I have a sing-song voice? (laughs) (laughs) Richard, Rick, Rick was telling me that, that uh, he was so impressed when he first met you as your ad-libbing ability. And he, he said it, it was an interesting analogy. He said it was love at first sight, like actually a lightning bolt hit him, like when you meet a girl, ah. which I found interesting. And you became the MC. You became yes, the, reg- the regular uh, MC there. Bill Mayer. Remember, the, remember that other MC, Gilbert? Oh, Bill yeah. Mar- Not Bill Marr, but Bill yes. Mayhew or Bill... That's how great he was. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, there was there was a Bill Maru. Bill Maru. That's the guy. And yeah. Bill Maru. Wait, Richard. Yes. Very what? important. Yes. He 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 sang a song that he <laughs> wrote, and I remember it to this day. That he wrote. Yes. Okay. Oh, what was it? Let me hear it. Make me laugh and make me cry make me live until i die no way. that's the way baby tenderly <laughs> let me love you forever <laughs> i'm so happy that there is someone who give me love in return Ba 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 ba. Now did he did he do it seriously? Yes. Oh, yes. That's the, yeah, there's that, a that tragedy. Was, that was <laughs> that was going to be his big hit. <laughs> Bill Maru. Uh, yes. My God. And remember Larry Ragland, uh, Oliver Shaw. Oh yeah, he's, he's become a fixture on okay. this show. Uh, oh, so we've talked about Larry. I thought I saw oh, a, a dummy, dummy in, in the window. The window. <laughs> <laughs> but the line. it was you. But it was you wearing a new dress as usual, <laughs> trying to look your best, impossible. Nah. <laughs> Richard, Rick, he's no longer with us. No. Did we lose so, Larry Reckland? Yes. Yeah. OTWHF. Out the window head first. But you know, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Rick, Rick said you, you had a bit, uh, Richard, where you used to take ladies' purses and pocketbooks and just go, go through them on stage and, yeah, and riff. Cute, <laughs> yeah. Uh, cute story about that. Um, uh, I was in um, San Diego working a club in Phoenix and. Uh, Robin Williams was in town doing a you know a much bigger venue obviously, but he came to see me. But before he came, I had come out on stage, and there was a, a guy in the audience with a backpack, and I said, "Let me see that." And I grabbed it and I started rummaging through it and riffing and doing jokes about the guy's address book and you know all this stuff that I found in there. And I, you know, like five minutes, six minutes, which is a long time, you know, to do something on that. Anyway, so later Robin shows up and he, I, you know, I saw him and he came up on stage and he didn't see me do the, the backpack bit, but I see him go for it. I go, shit, what's he going to do? Then he does like 20 brilliant minutes on, <laughs> on the backpack. <laughs> it was another night uh, where I was at the comedy store 
and I got a woman's purse, and there was a joint in it. And I, and I lit it up, and I started smoking it on stage. And Richard Pryor came on after me and said, you see my man Richard? Shit, smoking that shit. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, purse, well, Gilbert's a good ad libber too. I mean, if you find, I don't believe in, in um, I just believe in finding things, you know. Gilbert, unfortunately, has to bring a ton of shitty props on stage. You know, <laughs> Are you he's still a fucking <laughs> circus act? But aside from that, yes. Are you still doing the bit with the trays, Gil, and the uh, uh, yeah Mickey Mouse? See, but those started, funny as money. Uh, yep, yep. Those started when I was at the clubs, right? And these big serving trays would always be around that the right. waitresses that the waitresses used. Right? So I would just grab them and see what would pop into my head at the time. Right. See, that's what I mean about finding something and then turning into something else, and that's kind of writing on your feet. And I remember they had a bookcase at Catch Rising Star in the back of the stage, yes. and I used to pick stuff out of there. Uh huh. And remember, Andy Kaufman would start reading um, F. Scott Fitzgerald novel. What was it? Uh, oh, The Gatsby. A, what? The Great Gatsby. <laughs> he start reading The Great Gatsby. Like you know, in the, at the com, at, in Hollywood, at the Improv, and kept reading it until like half the audience left. <laughs> Just read the read read the fucking thing for like you know ten, fifteen minutes, and I, 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 I rem- yeah, I remember I saw Andy Kaufman go up on stage at uh, the Improv, and he started going. A hundred puddles of beer on the wall, a hundred yeah. puddles of beer. And at first they were laughing. And right. then he did the entire 100 <laughs> puddles of beer on the wall. And people were, were screaming and cursing. <laughs> One time he came out on stage and unrolled a sleeping bag and got in it and just went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you remember how Larry David used to get into fights on stage? In the audience. Yes. Well, I mean, one time, and I, this, this is a, I guess, a semi-famous story where I think Lily Tomlin was in the audience and he, somebody was, uh, was heckling him and he's, he said something like, yeah, why don't you put newspapers down when you have your period or something like that. <laughs> wow. Do you remember that? I, I remember one time uh, Larry David was on stage and and he got into a fight with somebody in the audience. Right. And and this guy goes, your mother fucks my dog. And Larry goes, oh, yeah, well, I bet your dog doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> you remember he used to do the thing about going to court for masturbating oh I, yes like you know he i had he did it on um i had him do it on hot properties and it was like 18 minutes long and then it was like they get his mother they get his mother on stand and the prosecuting attorney goes mrs david have you ever been to israel Answer the question, have you ever been to Israel? <laughs> you can bail me out whenever you want. I don't mind bombing with other people's material. <laughs> it doesn't hurt me at all. <laughs> now, I also remember you in the old days. Right. Uh, you know, when you opened for Fanny Bryce. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was very nice to me, yes. by the way. Fanny Bryce. Before yes. you would go on stage, Uh-oh. you would, like, inhale an oh. entire can of whipped cream. Well, uh, I don't remember that, but I don't remember <laughs> <deny it. laughs> <laughs> No, uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, I used to do that at Catch, you know? The Chinese cooks would put the can out for me. You know, they thought I was insane. <laughs> and um, that was the place where if you went in the kitchen, you yelled immigration. You know, it would cause quite a, quite a stir. That joke's from the 50s. But, uh, yeah, no, I used to, uh, you know, do a shot. What's in that? Nitrous something or other? I would do a shot of it because 
In reality, I think we're all a little bit terrified of going on, even, you know. So anyway, I'm just uh, making an excuse for getting high and going on. <laughs> Speaking of Rob, Rob and wasn't that, terrified that at all. That explains the heroin and cocaine. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. Meth. It was all artistically related. <laughs> Did you, you speaking of Robin Williams, Richard? Did you used to you and uh, Robin used to do a doo wop thing when when Belushi would do Joe Cocker? Did uh, you do well, you, you back, like a, a backup was, singer thing? Yeah, um, Robin. Yeah, there was one one time I remember where um, Belushi and I were singing doo wop, and Robin was signing it, which is pretty funny. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, Belushi loved coming up on stage. And there was one night where it seemed like everybody was in the audience and came up. One night I remember in, at, at the comedy store after Richard Pryor's accident, he had not gone on stage at all. And he was, he was in the audience and I was on stage and I got him to come up on stage. And um, we were doing improvs and stuff. And I remember uh, a, a young Jim Carrey came on stage with just a sock on his genitals. Like, you know, what? how else can you top Richard Pryor? You know, it's like he was just trying to upstage us. And he, and he came out and Richard Pryor leaned over to me and said, let's go. So we just walked off stage. <laughs> but it was a great night because I got Richard back on stage. You know, it was great. And and you, because I, I, I had the pleasure of improvising with Robin Williams on stage a few times. Mm -hmm. and, and you've done that You're right. a bunch of times. Yeah, well, one time, uh, fortunately, we have it on, we got it on video, where we're doing Casablanca. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, he was doing Peter Lorre, and I was doing Bogart, but at the same time. So, like, you start doing Peter Lorre, you know, Rick, do you, oh, yeah. you know, do you, uh, do you trust me? No. And yeah. do you despise me? And do you remember that scene oh, where yeah. he said, You despise yeah. me, don't yeah. you? I remember, they came in and they let, no, you got to keep going. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> you despise me, don't yeah. you? I remember the letters I'm of looking for some letters of transit. Yes, yeah, so and I remember oh, I had to buy the balls. I'm not a parasite. <laughs> But, it's, ah, but the strawberries, I'm just that's giving the people what they need. How about, how about Stinky? <laughs> oh, we used to do, yes. <laughs> you did Joe audience. Besser? Stinky is legendary. Dick no, and no, Stinky. Oh. I would oh, sit right. on your lap, right? and we'd be a ventriloquist team. We did right. that one year in, at, at uh, that big place in L.A. What oh, do you call with, it? where they did the... Uh, for the well, homeless. They helped the, they helped the, are they still homeless, by the way? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. No. No, it actually was for the homeless. Oh. Those were the only audience. Oh, you did get. it for comic relief. <sighs> yes. Oh, that, no, yeah. it was just for and, the homeless. <laughs> so, no one else would watch it. So I remember. And you would. You would talk, and but what I remember is when we do it off TV. Yes. You would do it in a Hasidic voice. No, stinky. <laughs> oh, Hitler should have killed all the Jews. Oh, and the city was a man with Church, let church, let over, Holly. <laughs> How many prayers went up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to do a very perverted. No, but you'd be really dirty. You know, yes. But, now, Stinky, we're going to, you know, say hello to the audience, Stinky. The audience could all go fuck themselves. Oh, hey, now, Stinky, that's not very nice. They could suck my wooden dick. Wait a minute. They'll get splinters in their lips. What did you do last night? <laughs> well, last night I was fucking your mother in the ass. Oh, God, she had splinters in her pussy. What's the matter with you? I needed a tweezer. I, was eating, I was eating your mother's rancid cunt. Oh, that was you. <laughs> I thought it was Woody Woodpecker. Anyway, I think we should revive that. Yes. Well, now that yeah. Otto and George are gone, there's a vacuum. Are they gone? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Otto passed well, away. I, no, the Who dummy's did? still going. The dummy's no, still... Dog, the dummy died, but the guy's... No, wait. <laughs> the dummy's still around. Yeah, the dummy's so around. Maybe he can work. <laughs> you know what I used to love was... Uh, ventriloquists, when they came out, They'd only use one microphone. Yeah. And I would have said, the whole fucking thing's out of the bag. You got to yeah. have the microphone for the guy and for the guy, right? <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> it just blows the whole illusion. 
So did you work Vegas at all? I've worked Vegas a couple of times. I was never a steady Vegas performer. Right. Like, did you do when Steve Sharippa ran oh, the Oh, yeah. Empire? Yeah, I worked with him. Right? I did work with Steve Sharippa. Yeah, yeah. Who later on went on to be on The Sopranos. Yeah, he became a really good actor. He's a great guy. But he wore a tuxedo and he ran the this club. It was like he it was, was so outcast. It, it was right? be. It was more mafiosa than The Sopranos was. Yeah, he was. <laughs> this was the real deal. He wasn't acting like some musicians who will go unnamed. If if you had him on on The Sopranos acting right. and dressing like he did in real life, the right. audience would complain it was too phony. <laughs> <laughs> now, who's this guy? Who does he think he is? Well, that's the danger of stereotypes, I guess. Why well, you have to stand out? Now, so, have you seen seen Letterman's beard? Oh yeah! Oh, he's come out of the closet. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm breaking the story here. Yeah, I've oh. seen the beard, and but it's gigantic. Oh yeah, it yeah. looks it looks like he can unhook it off his ears at any point. Yeah, right, right. And it'll but be I it. think it's like he's so relieved he doesn't have to shave every day and put on a suit and. You know, every you know, every night after the show, he'd look at the ratings with Jack Rollins and, you know, he'd stress over it. And and now he realizes, you know, what the fuck was I oh, stressing yeah. about? You know, he's like relaxing. What was weird with Leno is back then. Right. The war of Leno, Letterman and Conan was the most important thing in the world. Yeah. It was like a NATO conference. Or yes. Something. And the whole thing was Conan saying he won't go on at twelve oh five. You know what I mean? It's oh, like yeah, yeah, I remember like, that. What is it? The the is it like the the Vatican nightly show that if it doesn't go on at a certain time, everyone will go to hell. It's like the Tonight Show was over when Johnny Carson left. Yes, it's not the sacred church that everyone you know made it out to be anymore. It's a franchise, and and Jay was you know phenomenally lucky to last that long. You know, and the idea that Conan wouldn't, he got the gig and it would be from 12 to 1 instead of 1130. And so, you know, and then Leno behind it, it was like Shakespearean, you know, it was like Leno behind the scenes, pretending he didn't want it, but really does want it. And then, you know, one time he was in the bathroom when Warren Littlefield was in another room and he didn't know he was there and he's spying on these people. And it's like this whole intrigue over the Tonight Show. You know, and, so. and I, well, I always thought it's like, why do they all get so angry? It's like, well, like Letterman would get angry, like that he has the Letterman show, <laughs> but he doesn't have the Tonight Show. Well, he got over that. <clears throat> you know, Johnny Carson told him, you know, take, take it, man. Take CBS, take the show. Because David, at first, was thought he had lost but if you remember when he when he first did uh, the Letterman show on CBS, he was number one, you know he was beating Leno in the ratings. And yeah, he came in really strong, and then for some reason Hugh Grant's blowjob got Leno on the map and never went away. Yeah, that was a strange turning point. The that numbers just shift, shifted after that Hugh Grant interview. But then Dave yeah. was hip about it. They, they took that big billboard in Times Square and he said number three in late night. Yeah. Oh yes, no, he really. Did it, you know, treated it OK. Meanwhile, you know, he's he's making hundreds of millions of dollars for the network. Forget ratings. He's still, you know, generating all this money. It's interesting but, you talk about the beard and him kind of dropping out, Richard, because there was an interview published this week. And I found it interesting that he said at this stage of life, he's embarrassed that he was driven by his ego for so long. Oh, well, he's I mean, being too hard on himself. He was great at what he did. He yeah. should be proud and, you know, take this time. I think he'll go through another stage where he doesn't resent having to d done it all those years. Mm -hmm. But he was made out to be like this evil villain when they would talk about the wars between them. And I always I never quite I never, got that. I never got it either. And I think that was probably uh, Leno's, um, you know, publicity machine, publicity machine. You know, uh, leaking stories, and then I don't know. It's it, it's. I never got that from David that he was 
livid at Leno. I think at one point, you know, he would do he'd do jokes about Leno once in a while. But uh, I remember when Leno said, you remember when Leno announced in five years I'm leaving the show, which was one of the most bizarre. Do you remember that guy? Oh, yes, mm-hmm. yes. And it was like uh, the next night uh, Letterman comes on and he goes, yeah, like uh, he'll need a vacation in five years. <laughs> like, you know, like he's not being let go. You know what I mean? It's like that. But what a weird deal that was. I, I remember what stuck with me with the five-year thing. I used to be like this semi-regular that Leno yeah. would have in the opening sketches. Yeah, yeah. Like these, they dress me as Queen Elizabeth. I remember you did Jeopardy skits oh, and yeah. all kinds of things. And I'd be Queen Elizabeth, King Kong, uh, right. all these different characters. Not a stretch for you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Either one. And when he announced he'd be leaving in five years... Even then, I was going, oh, my God, in five years, I won't be doing this. <laughs> and, and you start worrying five years in advance. It's like China has the five-year plan. They, they think ahead. Or the 10-year plan. Jay had a five-year plan. But I went, what is he doing now? Gigs. I guess he does like 300 gigs Well, he's a year. got that car show that he's doing on, I think, CNBC. Jay Leno's Garage. Yeah, so what, 11 people watch that? Yeah. (laughs) It's like Seinfeld. Not a slam. That's not a slam. Yeah. Yeah. Seinfeld is uh, comedians in cars. Yeah. And then Jay Leno is uh, cars in my garage. So it's (laughs) like. So what should we do? You and I should do something. Uh, Uh, Get like a. I see them on roller skates. I I see them on skateboards. (laughs) Do you know, I once, I'm so proud of this. Yes. One time on some Nazi uh, propaganda site, they (laughs) gave a list. They were exposing who's a Jew. And (laughs) and they exposed me as a Jew. Oh, that's a proud moment. Yeah, because it was was always so well hidden. (laughs) It was always so well hidden that I was a Jew. And... And they they had me with people like Steven Spielberg and ah! and, and Jeffrey Katzenberg and or anybody with a bird. And I remember they had Jamie Lee Curtis, and it said Jamie Lee Curtis, actress and daughter of Kai Tony Tony Curtis. <laughs> Daughter of Kite Tony Curtis, whose real name was Bernie Schwartz. Bernie Schwartz, yeah. yeah. From Brooklyn. Oh, and one story that I talked about that Frank asked me. Oh, yeah, because it's so good. <laughs> What's that? I think he told it on, on Richard's show. On, on your show. You had that TV show. I think it lasted half an episode or something. It was canceled during the first commercial break, but (laughs) fortunately, you were on it. During the introduction, during the opening monologue, they canceled it. (laughs) (laughs) No, we're talking about the other other show, Richard Bowser's Conversation. That's the one, right. One time, Elie Wiesel, uh, who was that, he was a famous writer. Yeah, the author of Night. Yes. Right, right. And he... He used to write about his experiences. He himself was a concentration camp survivor. Survivor. When he was a little child, he was in the camps. Right. And his parents and and the rest of his family, brothers and sisters and grandmother, all perished in the concentration camps. So he was talking about that. And, you know, very sad you know, well, you know, gives you this feeling in the pit of your stomach and chokes you up. And the host was one of these typical daytime hosts with like the uh, processed hair that looks like a he- the helmet hair and right. a nice suit and a <clears throat> cap teeth. And 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 he asked him, he goes, "If you had any wish." Uh, uh, in the world right now, what would that wish be? And Elie Wiesel said, uh, I would wish that people wouldn't just stand by. He goes, 
the Holocaust happened because people just stood by. Atrocities in the world continue because people just stand by. And the host puts his hand on Elie Wiesel's knee and turns to the camera and he goes, and we're going to ask you to stand by <laughs> while we make this commercial break. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Incredible. And I thought... Of all the bad taste things I could come up with, I couldn't top no that one by a no. mile. Right, and you get in trouble. Yes. <laughs> I remember watching it with my jaw hanging open. <laughs> oh. Do you remember who that was? I don't. It Let's was see if we can the... find it. Yeah. Yeah, you should. Re- we should search that and and track that guy down. I was in a daze. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> oh, after seeing Oh, him. yes. Yes. Um, another great thing that we talked about on, on my uh, show, which is on YouTube, by the way, Richard Belzer's conversation. Um, Gilbert was telling the story about when is humor appropriate and how he had to. Uh, there was a roast right after 9-11. And Gilbert did this legendary reading of the uh, aristocrats joke, which, you know, became a kind of cathartic for the audience and was really, you know, a great moment, uh, you know, culturally and comedically. And I was very proud of Gilbert, who inadvertently filled filled that gap and that void in, in, uh, in the best way possible. And uh, we were saying at the end of this talk, in recounting it, Gilbert said, yeah, okay, you know, Al-Qaeda bombed us and, you know, they're supposed to terrorize us. Here's what we're doing. We're writing jokes about it. So, you know, bomb us again. We'll write some more fucking material. Not that they should bomb us again. But it had what you did had the opposite effect of what they wanted is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I always kind of felt like then, I mean, the the worst thing you could do to Al-Qaeda or the Taliban is after they bomb the World Trade Center is uh, and they go, well, what are the Americans doing now? And if you said the Americans are just laughing about it. Yeah, right. Yeah, that, the that's initial, how much yeah. you affected them. Right. Anyway. But but because uh, I, I remember I started out in in that um, in the roast, I said I st- Wanted to start with a bad taste joke, of course. And and I said, <laughs> surprisingly, <laughs> and I said I have to leave early tonight. I have to catch a flight to L.A. I couldn't get a direct flight. We have to make a stop at the Empire State Building. <laughs> and they were booing and hissing, and uh-huh. one guy screamed too soon, uh-huh. which I thought meant I didn't take a long enough pause between the setup and punchline. <laughs> And then I do the aristocrats, and they're like howling and applauding and standing right. up, and it's so weird. Did that night? I've asked you this before. Did that night lead to Penn and Paul's movie, or they, they I, said they already had it in the works, and yeah, it just was a, a coincidence? I think they may have already had it in the works, and and this was a coincidence. Mm-hmm. I think. You know, Gil uh, Penn told me the story about. When he was making the movie, I mean, he made the movie, yeah. And there was a screening in L.A., and um, he came out of the screening. And who was the the announcer for oh, Gary Last Owens? Days? Oh, Gary Owens. You know, do you from, know this story, Gil? From from uh, uh, Ronan laughing. Martin's laughing. It's beautiful downtown yeah. Burbank. So he comes out of the screening and says to Penn, "You know, uh, this was great, but um, I remember." Uh, when I was really young and working, uh, Jack Benny and George Burns would do the aristocrats to embarrass the secretaries in the office. (laughs) Wow. And Penn said, you motherfucker, I'll never talk to you again. Why didn't you tell me that so I could put it in the movie? Because can you imagine, you know, then he takes his cock and he puts it in her ass and sits on his son's head. And uh, then, then he's, 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 he's fingering her asshole. 
And then, and then he pisses on his daughter, you see. And, and but, then, yeah. then the, 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 the father is, is licking his daughter's pussy. <laughs> so you can Incredible. imagine. And I remember he said, Penn told me when he was interviewing Gary Owens for the movie and he spent a day, it was like pulling teeth. He did? Yeah. Interview him. Oh, yeah. I didn't. Because yeah. I, I, he yeah. interviewed him and couldn't get shit out of him. And then at the premiere. <laughs> and he had that story. Hadn't the joke been around so long that there were different versions of it or if it was oh, called the Sophisticados? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The Sophisticates. The it was, Sophisticates, it, it, yeah. It's been traced back to, like, the turn of the century. I think and Christ very, told that joke. No, one of the apostles <laughs> told <laughs> At a dinner, yeah. not the Last Supper, another dinner. You know, I still want to do, Gil, and we'll, God damn it, we'll do it. The Last Supper, Last Supper, First Roast. You know, you got that Da Vinci painting, you get comics dressed as all those That's people, great. and they all roast Christ. And then he gets up at the end and, like, is funnier than anybody. Yeah. You, you, you told Richard, are you? Want to do that? Yeah. Get the guy with the camera. You want to do, let's do, uh, come on. He's on you. You, can, you can't see him, but he's he's recording it. You you told you told arguably the best roast joke ever, which was, uh, and I don't want to tell the uh, joke. If I remember. it's It was a joke about Freddie Roman's non-TV career. Do you remember the joke? Uh, yes. Uh, Jack Ruby had a longer TV career than Fred. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. I don't want to say his material is old, but I used to call him Freddy the Roman. <laughs> oh, my wonderful. favorite roast joke is, um, I did it a few times, I, I have to confess, but the first time I did it was... Uh, um, the only t- uh, the only time Bill Maher has a funny bone in his body is when I fuck him in the ass. That's a right one. <laughs> I did it about a couple other people. And do you remember how many variations of Thick of the Night there were when, like, it was one of those things, that horrible thing happens with TV shows where rather than put them out of their misery. Right. They start retooling. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they fired me and brought in Arsenio. Oh, yes. Well, wait, wait a minute. Originally, it was Charles Fleischer. Did we get fired? Did we, you get fired? I right? was fired. Yeah, I was too. Yeah. He was he was ahead of his time firing me because now I just <laughs> con- right. continued getting fired. <laughs> well, actually, first I was fired from Saturday. SNL night happened Live. first, right? Yeah, SNL, and yeah. then I that, was that's fired. The precedent. From- <laughs> was it Chloe Webb, you, Richard, yes. and Charles Fleischer, and and Isabel Grandy? Okay, yeah, and and Mike Mike. Uh, oh yeah, oh, what was his name? The big Goyesha guy. We used to ask him. The big sticker. We used to ask him, because he was the Goyam on the show, right. to right. pound on the door and go, Jews, <laughs> gather your belonging. And, and what we both noticed is both of us used to try it, and it never came across that way. But when you had some big Gentile do it, <laughs> it sent chills up your spine. Right, we couldn't do it. Who would take us seriously? <laughs> Were you, in- you know that story? Go ahead, Rich. Go ahead, Go ahead Rich. No, I- no, the story about Liza Minnelli um, in the, I think it was the 70s, she was touring in Europe with her band. And um, her husband at the time, by the way, told me this story. <laughs> Years later, uh, they're, they're touring all over Europe and they're working in Berlin in Germany. And it turns out everybody in the band is Jewish. And one of the guys, I forget which one, said, you know, what the fuck, man? What are we doing? You know, entertaining Germans. We're all Jews. You know what? And he's ranting about this. You know, we're Jews in Germany. Don't we have responsibility? And there's a knock on the door. And it's, is there any Jews in there? <laughs> And they all just drop to their fucking jaws dropping. My dog can bark. Another knock at the door. Is there any Jews in there? And they're like, they're fucking frozen. The guy says, Liza wants orange juice. Is there any Jews in there? Oh, God. True story. Oh, Lord. 
<laughs> Why is Avant orange juice? <laughs> is there any Jews in there? <laughs> Can you imagine if that was you and me? God. It's so perfect <laughs> in the middle of a Nazi story to have barking dogs there. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> they don't sound like well, shepherds, though. They're at the door. Harley's wrapping up what little we have. We don't have much time. <laughs> the trucks are outside, so hurry up. <laughs> I got one last joke for you. 300 Jews get on a truck. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you remember, uh, I think we talked about this on the phone the other day. Uh, Adam Keefe, when he used oh to do monster God. impressions, you yes. know, he did Bella Lugosi as a stand up comic. You know, when one of the jokes bombed, and he would go, These are the jokes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Gil, you used to do the Bella Lugosi bit. When when, when somebody asked what time it is, what was the bit? Oh, uh, Bela Lugosi, when he's not wearing a watch and you ask him what time it is. (laughs) Ten. I remember that one. Do you know the story of Peter Laurie and Boris Karloff? We went to Lugosi's funeral, and they're standing next to the casket. And Peter Lorre says to Boris Carla, do you think we should drive a stake through his heart just to make sure? <laughs> At his funeral. I, I heard a story that one time, in, like in their last years, when Lugosi was staying in a hotel. They put them in the same hotel room with Tor Johnson, <laughs> who, if you right. remember from... Uh, Plant 9. Was yes. that when they were making the black sleep? Oh, yeah. yeah. And Or or it might have been um, Plan 9 uh-huh. from Menace uh-huh. Space. And he was, you know, for people, you everybody would know him immediately. Yeah, he was, he was a a, actually ball. a wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. Big and fat sweet, ball Swedish ball guy. Swedish wrestler. Cheap monster movies. <laughs> and... One time, uh, they said, Lugosi, he was drugged out and drunk and, and depressed, right. and, and he was going, I don't want to live anymore. I just want to die. All I want is to die. And Tor Johnson got fed up with him, <laughs> and he picked Lugosi up in the air, carried him out to the balcony and held him over the balcony and he goes Bela want to die? Uh, I kill Bela. <laughs> <laughs> and and Lugosi goes I go inside now. <laughs> oh, they should have put that in the Ed Wood movie. They should have. I was just <laughs> thinking that. Fantastic. I go inside now. <laughs> Richard, so, you-, you know who used to be roommates at uh, the Chateau Marmont? Oh, Peter Laurie and Billy Wilder. Wow. wow. Isn't that wild? That's good stuff. Weren't, weren't they both Austrian? Um, well, I think so. I think so. I think so. Well, no, wasn't wasn't Peter Laurie German? Oh, yeah, yeah he was right. German. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. In You're fact, right. Peter right. Laurie right. escaped from Germany on the same boat as um Oh, geez. What's the the famous uh, Metropolis? Fritz Lang. Fritz Lang. Fritz Lang. Yeah. Fritz Lang and Peter Lorre wow. were on the same boat oh. leaving for America. That's good stuff. And, and when Fritz it, Lang it. was leaving, he was married. Uh, his wife, Fritz Lang's wife, tried to turn him into the Third Reich. Really? Yeah. I never heard that. That's yeah. great. You wanted to make a Lenny Raffenstahl out of him? Oh, God. Yes. Is that what yeah, that, like that? that fucking bitch, Lenny Raffenstahl. <laughs> she was this woman director for the audience right. who doesn't yeah. know, who used to do propaganda films. But unfortunately, she was a genius. Yeah. yeah there's a great documentary about her. Right. And she lived to be like a 99 or yeah. some ridiculously yeah. obscene age. No. Yeah, she lived forever. And, and she, it would always be she had no idea what Hitler was doing. I don't buy not. that. That's yeah. not true. Yeah. She's fully aware of what he was doing. Oh, I mean, it, it's like Hitler saying, oh, I didn't know I was gone. Oh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> were there that many? Oh. <laughs> there was an interview. One time, 
uh, uh, Melanie Griffith, she had done a World War II film. Oh, some yeah. Es- espionage. Oh, oh, yeah. Shining Through or something yes, with Michael I think Douglas? So. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, with yeah. Michael Douglas. Yeah. And, and never, never saw it. And, and Nor did I. So she had a read up. On on World War II, Melanie <laughs> <Hillary Hillary>. Griffith. <laughs> Griffith. Uh-huh. Okay, so and, she did some research, and she said in an interview, "I didn't know they killed six million Jews." <laughs> <laughs> even and, if she, you know, she should have not said anything. And then she buries herself even further when they said, "You didn't know about the six million Jews," and she goes, "Well, I thought maybe a few thousand." <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> That's way off, huh? <laughs> Maybe a few thousand. Wow. Richard, you want to talk at all about uh, something I just – some good stuff I found doing research was uh, Dick Ballantyne and uh, the, the wonderful Lampoon stuff from, oh, yeah. uh, from, from Radio uh, Hour and That's Not Funny, That's Sick. Right. Well, that was uh, – we, we did the National Lampoon Radio Hours. Me, Chris, uh, Gilda. Chris Guest. Chris yeah. Guest, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Chris Guest, Brian, Doyle Murray, Billy Murray, uh, sometimes Gilda and John, um, and myself, O'Donohue sometimes. Uh-huh. And um, and thinking of, I haven't thought about it in a while, but it was so kind of ahead of its time. What well, Not that I, you know. Very much so. Yeah, it was very hip. It was very funny and dark, and it was satire and all the things that you want wanted the lampoon to be in his glory days. And one time, you know, like um, John and I did a bit Baby Brandos. Yeah, it's on YouTube. Oh, People can see it. Oh, it is. Yeah, oh, cool. or, or listen to it. It's wonderful. Oh yeah, and uh, but a lot of stuff came out of that. I mean, the way it started, the Dick Ballantyne was a call-in character. Dick Ballantyne. The best looking guy you'll ever hear yep. was, uh, <laughs> and uh, I got the name because I was in a I I was in one little voiceover studio, and everyone else was around a table with mics, at a, you know, in the next studio, and I told them I don't want to know any of the questions, uh, you know, just let's just fly, and I got the name because I was we were drinking Ballantine ale at the time for some reason. So I called myself Dick Ballantyne. And then they just started calling me, you know, Billy and John and Brian. And, and it was uh, uh, at the risk of being immodest. It was it was so much fun. And we got so much great material out of it. And uh, they're so good. I mean, I do. I, 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 I urge people to go to YouTube and find this stuff. Yeah. The album. And uh, that's not funny. That's sick is has something like the greatest. That's the one with the frogs. Frog oh, Sam Gross's fa- famous cartoon, right? Yeah, with no legs, you know. Now, uh, what do you remember about John Belushi? Um, his laugh, his uh, his big heart, his um, the things that people don't know about him, like taking care of relatives in Europe, and and uh, uh, I did a play. We did a show together, the National Lampoon Show. And I took Harold Ramis was the original cast was Harold, Billy Murray, Gilda, and John, and Brian Doyle, I think. Yeah, yeah, Brian Doyle Murray, I believe. Anyway, and so, and, and so Harold left, and they brought me in uh, to the cast, and uh, John found out I wasn't making what everyone else in the cast was making, and he went to Ivan Rittman and said, you know, you gotta. You know, you got to pay him the same. And anyway, but we, John and I, would go roam around New York City just like two eleven-year-old kids, just looking for trouble. We'd go to massage parlors just to eat the food, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got thrown out once. We went, we went, just went in this once massage parlor, and we go in this one room. It's all like velvet rugs and all, you know, smoke and mirrors, literally. And the woman comes out. Um, saying, you know, you could have whatever you want. She describes all these different things, you know. And now, what would you really like? And John said, can I get a roast beef sandwich? <laughs> 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 and so they, they, she called the manager right away. She didn't even uh, to do any more riffings. Get out of here. <laughs> and, um, we, yeah, we would do a lot of street uh, stuff, street theater, you know. 
if we needed a ride, John would just step in the street and, you know, four cars would pull over if he wanted a ride. He, John was like, I, I, not, not to be corny, but he was a guy that when you saw him, you just, you felt like some kind of connection with him. You know, it's like he, he had this, he was a, like a force of nature. He was just all this energy and he just wanted to like, you know, live and get everything out of the moment. And in a lot of ways, not all I'm talking about, he reminds me of Richard Pryor. Richard always wanted to play and discover things. And, you know, it was like being around John was was the opposite of kryptonite. You know, it was a comedy uh, comedy speed or something without the drugs. And and what about Gilda? Gilda, Gilda was just the most, the sweetest, fragilest, but very funny. And, um, and she used to go with Bill Murray and he would... I shouldn't say what happened. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a cute story about the days when we did the Lampoon show. Um, uh, John had kept saying, uh, you got to meet this guy. He's one of the funniest guys. And he's coming down. Dan Aykroyd I hadn't met Dan. This is like, you know, early 70s. And John's, and John's talking about Dan Aykroyd, Dan, and all fucking week. Where do you see this? You know, they're all to everybody in the cast is saying, Bells, wait, Dan Aykroyd, Dan Aykroyd. So one night, Dan Aykroyd had motorcycled in from Toronto, like nonstop or some ridiculous fucking thing. So he come, you know, he comes into the dressing room and he sits down on the floor and passes out. So for the next week, I was saying to John, was, "Yeah, he's really fucking funny, your buddy that came." <laughs> yeah, oh, funniest guy in the world. Yeah, great. And it turned out to be, we used to call him the Orson Welles of comedy. That was uh, Dan's nickname because he was so talented. And he just, he'd be writing a uh, screenplay and on the phone and, ta- you know, doing three different things at once. And Bill Murray? Billy was, um, he was a guy who just was fearless. And uh, I remember one night uh, when they were casting Saturday Night Live, we were out with um, uh, Billy and I believe Lorne and who was the guy who was the sports guy at NBC? But Dick, then, Dick Ebersol. Exactly. Dick Ebersol was there and Chevy and I forget who else was there. But it, um, we were coming out of the dinner and we're on 57th and um, 7th on the corner. And there was a gigantic puddle, like a, a really, you know, how they can get in New York. And um, Chevy is hailing a cab and he just falls in the puddle. Just totally, <laughs> completely. Just to make us laugh. You know, it's this kind great. of it's great. commitment, you know. And I think that was the moment where Ebersol said, okay, there's, you know. And then we were in the bar and catch one night. It was Bill. Huh? It was Bill Murray that did it, right? Who are we talking about, Chevy or Bill Murray? Bill Murray. <laughs> oh. Well, both. Either both. one. Either one. No, that was Chevy who did that. Oh, Chevy. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, you said Chevy. I have che- Alzheimer's disease. I forget my own. Alzheimer's disease. I love that. No, I'll Billy. You want to hear about Billy? Yes. No, uh, no, the same setup. I mean, no, well, Billy was was um, would used to do this character, the honker. Do you ever see the honker? I'm not no, sure. No, I don't think so. Oh, well, did you ever see the Lampoon show that I did? No. Anyway, he did this character who was a homeless guy who would like direct traffic and and you know he would like uh, heckle New York. Hey, Chrysler Building, big deal. You know, like he would he he was he was just this brilliant homeless guy who just did all these great rants. But he would do them in the street. He would do you know, and people thought he was real, and he had that kind of crazy. For some reason in the 70s, we used to do a lot of shit in the street or in restaurants <laughs> or, you know, at, for not for any audiences, you know, like after hours joints or, you know, the green kitchen or some of the funniest shit was never seen, was seen by six people. Still or, there, you know, the green kitchen. And it and is still there. Yeah. You you were in at least two movies without Pacino. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was in author, author. Uh, where I played the uh, stage manager, mm-hmm. and then I was in Scarface, uh, where I played uh, myself as well. I played a comic at the Babylon Club. But I remember during, well, I shouldn't say this, 
Anyway, uh, what else? <laughs> I was just going to say about those Lampoon shows. I mean, they're really a precursor to Saturday Night Live. It's 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 fair to say. As was the Groove Tube in seventy uh, four. Groove Tube was the direct inspiration for Saturday Night yeah. Live, according to Lauren. Yeah. Well, Lauren Michaels came to New York, and you know, uh, I set him up with uh, my old one of my old girlfriends, and uh, you know, he knew that I, I mean, he met you know John, and you know, he came to see. The show, the Lampoon show, and he cast John and Billy. Well, he, he cast John and Gilda, and later Bill uh, and later Billy. But uh, came out of that show, so you know. The, and Michael O'Donoghue. Michael O'Donoghue, yeah, was in early on with with Lauren in creating the Saturday Night Live. You've got to see those for, for for our listeners. You've got to go to YouTube and see that stuff. Yeah, but you're right. It's all from the Lampoon. Yeah, but but even yeah, the the Groove Tube. It's great. Well, that was coming. That came out of Channel One with Chevy, right? That's right. And Ken Shapiro. Ken Channel Shapiro. One and also under, underground television. It was a there was a video theater. There were three black and white monitors. There was a ninety seat theater. You paid three dollars, and uh, people, I, we couldn't believe it. You know, seventy two or whatever. People paying to watch TV. It was like yeah. hip and, underground television. And Frank told me he found it that time I roasted you at the Friars. Well, it's on Bell's website. Yeah. yeah. You mean at the at the uh, uh, what's the hall where I did my town hall? Oh yes. Yeah, it's a two thousand and one roast. Yeah. Yeah, Town Hall. That was in yeah. Town Hall. And now tell us the Al Pacino story, for Christ's sakes. Which one? You started to tell an Al Pacino story and then said, no, I shouldn't say that. Well, all right, I'll tell it, but I think Al uh, won't. Well, no, never mind. He and I robbed a bank one night <laughs> at the method exercise, and we shot the teller in the arm and... I never said that publicly anywhere. No. Um, anyway, what else? Oh, so, but you you knew him somewhat, Al Pacino. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he, uh, there was a one night where um, Joe Pesci, uh, my good friend, brought all these people in to see me at Caroline's on 8th Avenue. He brought in Christopher Walken and... Um, Peter, well, I knew Peter Rieger, uh, Bobby De Niro, and uh, Christopher Lambert, and uh, who, I forget who else. I think Jilly was there, um, you know, Frank Sinatra's friend. Yeah. Wow, Jilly Rizzo. Yeah, he was a big fan of mine, and I used to make fun of him, and De Niro would say, you just, did you just do that tonight because he was here? Or I was, no, I do it all the time. <laughs> but, um, no, Al used to come in, you know, and not make a beeline but he saw me a few times and you know once wrote me a letter which i've saved which was he saw saw my hbo special and and uh wrote me a great little note so i have no great stories about he and i did, did de niro study you richard for for no uh, that's for, a myth yeah yeah it's, 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 it's on imdb i thought it might be bullshit yeah no we were we were hanging out when he was getting ready and doing the movie king of comedy huh king of comedy for yeah audience. king of comedy uh was the movie we're talking about yeah no uh, I it, it wasn't doing me at all as a matter of fact that that takes credit away from his creation of mm-hmm. this this uh, comic who, when you think about it, actually did get some stupid, some laughs in the guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, yeah. Really, the movie was much more appreciated after it was in theaters. Well, we've talked about it on this show. It's un- it's oh, really, thank you. Yeah, it's underrated. Yeah, it's one of those movies. I think they didn't like it because there's something very frustrating about every portion of the movie. It's like the way the story goes isn't the way the audience wants it to go. Uh-huh. You know, it's a very odd movie. Yeah. Like, you you don't want De Niro to win at the end because he's a bad guy. But and Jer- somehow you root for him. Yeah. yeah. And Jerry's character is so sympathetic. Which brings us... Yeah, Jerry Lewis. Your, your, you became friends with <clears throat> legendary comedian Jerry Lewis. Cute story about Raging Bull. All the scenes... Where you see the the Tony Randall Tonight Show, you know that 
Oh, yeah. The show that's supposed to be The Tonight Show that he, you know, gets on by kidnapping Jerry. Yeah. Oh, The Jerry Langford Show, yeah. The Jerry Langford Show that he gets on by kidnapping Jerry. All those scenes, Marty said to Jerry Lewis, you direct those scenes. Who knows television better than you? So all those scenes were directed by Jerry. Wow. Oh, I never yeah. knew that. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And one time... Marty and Jerry got in a little argument about something, and Jerry went over. I mean, Marty went over to his director's chair and pulled Jerry's book out of the sleeve and said, "Well, this is from your fucking book." <laughs> 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 you imagine? Yeah, I think that was the ultimate, or filmmaker, or something that Jerry. Yeah, yeah, wrote. no, not the ultimate. It was a, it was a very instructive, you know. A lot of the directors who came on uh, Homicide and Law and Order, they all swore, you know, used that book. I it's heard serious... Spielberg would go to sometimes yes. Jerry's class. Yes. He was teaching. Well, I think a lot of those guys did, Luke and Spielberg. No, but Jerry was, when I was young, a little kid, I looked exactly like Jerry Lewis. Yeah. And uh, they be- Dean and Jerry became partners in 1945. I was born in 1944. So by the time I was four five, six years old, I was doing Jerry Lewis bits. I had this zip, you know, haircut, and uh, I must say, I, you know, when you see pictures, I, I look just like them. And my mother was very physical. She used to beat the shit out of me all the time. But once in a while, <laughs> I would do Jerry Lewis and make her laugh and, you know, break the tension, and she wouldn't beat the shit out of me. And I told Jerry, you know, that I'm taking off my shirt because I want to show you something. Um, a tattoo. Yes. Oh, cool! Uh, nothing else. Oh, wow! The screen's not big enough. We should say but, that. We should tell our listeners that we we're looking at Richard on Skype. Oh, okay. Yeah. In yeah. France, I'm they don't. They, they'd be shirt. confused. We got to see this. Yeah, he's so, doing uh, a strip. Tease he's stripping. For us. Yes. So. Oh my God! Oh, that's fantastic! So there is a tattoo of the the iconic. Dara, you should snap, Dara's going to snap a picture if you hold that, uh, Richard. It's okay. it's that classic Jerry Lewis caricature, right? That he that, used from, from the, the tele- yeah. And I added the little red handkerchief. I associate that it, that caricature with the telethons because they always use that. They used that it image. for years, and then they they changed it. And yeah, one of the thrills of my life was being at the telethon. You know, because, you know, a lot of comedians' lives, and civilians may not understand this, but uh, are, were shaped in a way by the telethons. Because, first of all, Jerry inarguably is, you know, easily top ten, maybe top three funniest people ever in, in the history of show business. And, um, the Gil, do you want me to do something? Did no, you- nothing, nothing. Oh. Uh, you threw me off. I'll be back. Oh, no, I'm minute. sorry. <laughs> no, what was I talking about? Uh, he that Jerry Lewis is one of like the funniest people. Oh yeah, and then was before that, and he on the telethon. You were talking about how the telethon influenced so many people oh, yeah, in comedy. Yeah. No, I'm talking about all. The, thank you. I'm talking about uh, how comedians would watch the telethon and just study him. Right? Oh, Gil? yes. I mean, I, we'd call each other up and talk about, you know, watch it on, like, you know, Paul Schaefer and Marty Short. And P- we would be on the phone. Sometimes, you know, guys would tape it. <laughs> it was on 24 <laughs> hours, but still tape some of it. And, and all these moments that were, when you think about it, it's, you know, started in the 50s. I remember, and this was a, this, this really ruined a lot of it for me. In the old days of the telethon, they would have the closing titles when Jerry went off. After he sang, when you walk through a storm, yes. they would have the closing titles and they would go, you know, da, 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 and and when they they didn't when they were scared of losing people because they would go to their uh, local affiliates with the telethon would continue right right after the song it would immediately switch to the, the local affiliates right. and uh 
it they did away with that theme song and the credits, and that to me was like a religious experience when that music came on. Yeah, and put a button on the whole thing. And I I remember a couple of times in my early days getting off stage, and and if it was a good set that I did, I would hear that in my head. Oh, that's oh, great. That music. Yeah. That's your playoff music. Yes. You should tell them at Caroline's the next time you're there. Uh, yes. just, <laughs> just dial that up. <laughs> no, really, that would be great. And what, is, what did Paul Schaefer play, uh, play you on with? When oh, you did he like- used to play me on with a combination of the two shows I was fired from and failed miserably on. Saturday Night Live and, and uh, Thick of the Night. He made a combination <laughs> of the two. <laughs> Give me a little taste. Yeah. Oh, oh it's, it's a hard one. You know, it was like... And now what I what I've um, it's funny, I was talking to uh Penn Gillette, and uh-huh. both of us had the same God, a- God bless him, by the way. God bless him. Uh, he, <laughs> He's a big atheist. Yeah. He both of us had the same experience as far as Jerry Lewis was concerned. Both of us would be extremely cynical and acerbic talking about Jerry Lewis, joking about his self-importance and right. oh, the great filmmaker and making fun of sucking on a lozenge <laughs> while he's talking. Or, yeah, yeah, and, right. You know, yeah. When, oh, I, when I approach cinema... Oh, I am. That was a serious period, yeah. <laughs> and but both of us, when we would meet Jerry Lewis, it would all change. Of course, of course, there he was, and he, you know, it's like when I did the Tonight Show. We'll get back to Jerry in a second, but it's like when I did the Tonight Show the first time. Johnny Carson came in my dressing room. And was like. Whoa, there he is in 3D. Oh, yes. Like, you know, he's so used to seeing him in 2D on your television for years, and then there he is in the room, and there's like, you know, (laughs) contour. But uh, what were we talking about before that? Oh, Jerry Lewis, when you meet him, when you're with him in person. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've seen, I've been with him a lot and seen how people react to him. And the, the, the one universal thing is, Everyone becomes 11 years old when they see him. Yes. Whether they're 80 or 60 or, you know, how, because, you know, he's been around for so long, you know, it, it's like people have grown, literally grown up with him and I, you know, and loved him and then didn't love him, then loved him again. You know, like, it's just like breaking up with a chicken, going back and back and forth. He's been around so long. He's, you know, his sheer genius has worn us out and he still stands, you know, he's going to be 90, by the way, in March. Well, I know, like, I made jokes about him all the time. I'll, I'll, like, imitate him singing, like, when you walk through a storm. And, (laughs) but then it's the, also, when I see him, I'm a little kid watching Jerry Lewis. Yeah. You were with him at the Friars recently, and he said something to you that, uh... Uh, oh, Mike, well, one time, and this was one of my, I'll always remember this one, I was at some event, and I went up doing all these dirty, sick jokes. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. In a shock. And Jerry walks up to me afterwards, and he goes, Gilbert, you are out of your fucking mind. <laughs> And then he go. He looks at me in the eyes, and he goes, "And I wouldn't want you any other way." That's, Ultimate compliment. That's great. I, I thought, "Wow, Jerry yeah. Lewis accepted." And he me. meant it. He loves you know. Yes. He loves when comedians are good, and you know, he's not. You know, he he was he roots for comedians, but if he doesn't like them, then watch out. And my other <laughs> big thrill, they they honored him at the Friars Club. And we're outside, and there's a big mob of people, and and the that guys. Roast, his roast, you mean? Oh no, no! This is when they honored him when they put oh, okay. a plaque that was recently. of him yeah. on the friars, right? And you know there was a 
big mob of people there, and someone was, and whenever the speakers went on, Jerry was heckling them, which was funny. <laughs> and and Jerry turned to me and he goes, "So Gilbert, is anything all right?" <laughs> And then Jerry would heckle the people there, make a joke, and he he'd smile at me and squeeze my arm. Ah, oh, he was like doing it for you. Yeah, and I, I thought, wow. And you got a little yeah. glimpse of that old pure Jerry. Yes. It's like that moment in King of Comedy where for some reason he does the Jerry run. Oh yes. As he's running as he's in the crosswalk. <laughs> he just breaks character for a second. Also, when he when they uh first were doing the movie uh, it wasn't Jerry uh, Langford. It was another name. I forget what it was. And Jerry said, "Marty, if we're doing exteriors, you, you know, you bet you got to. I'll show you what I mean. You got to change my name to Jerry. Come on, I'll show you what I mean." And they just go outside of the office and they start walking down the street. Hey, Jerry! You know, cab drivers, people. Oh, yeah. You know, Jerry, construction guy. Hey. And there, actually, there's a scene in the movie where he's in the street and people are yelling, Jerry. And that's those are real people and not extras. Or Jerry, you look great. And he says, you should see me in my white taffeta. <laughs> <laughs> and one part of the movie, they hired someone to do it, an actress. But that was based on real life was when that woman was on the payphone. And Jerry is walking down the street. <laughs> oh, and yeah. Jerry said this happened in real life. And they put it in the movie. Jerry was walking down the street and a woman was on a payphone. And she goes, say, say hello to my cousin. Say hello to my cousin. Come on. Say. And, and he, Jerry was in a hurry right. at the time. And the woman yelled, I hope you die of cancer. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite moments. You should only get cancer. Yeah. Okay. It's great stuff. We, One we, cute story before we go. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm walking down the street in New York, and uh, there's this guy walking towards me, and he's all excited and everything. Oh, shit, I got a fucking, you know, a guy sign an autograph, or not that I don't appreciate it, but just, I guess I wasn't in the mood that day. And he's, you know, he's coming, he's like so excited, and he comes up to me and he goes, is today Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> and here I thought, oh, an autograph. And I, I remember walking down the street with Larry David. Larry and David. and I, I, at that point, was first starting to get big. I was on the Letterman show, right. and I had done a special and everything. And we're walking, and Larry David's not expecting anything. And this homeless black guy comes over to us with his clothes all ripped up and old smelly and a pea stain in his pants. And he comes over, and I'm thinking, oh, God, he's going to come over to me because he sees us. Yeah. And he runs over and hugs Larry David <laughs> and goes... Yeah, David from Fridays. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> okay. Before, just before we run, oh, I want to yes. direct people to Richard's website. Uh, not only can you see the whole roast there from 2001, which is wonderful. Gilbert, Irwin, Corey, Paul yeah, Schaefer, it, it Jeff Ross. Yeah. But also there's a wonderful short there that David Steinberg directed called It Didn't Happen One Night. And it's you guys. Oh, that's the, our yes. Cinemax show. Cinemax. The who played the bartender. And a very young Tom Leopold, a friend of ours, right. a, a mutual that's friend right. of ours. And it, there's, there's this bizarre clip of you guys reading the newspaper and doing dueling Groucho Marx, uh, excuse me, Chico <laughs> Marx, Chico Marx, Chico Marx yeah. impressions. And it's, yeah, and it's wonderful and strange. Jackie Mason reading R.D. Lang. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I see you, you see me, but you can't see what I'm really thinking about. The, and, and this person thinks he sees this person, but this person's not looking at that person. <laughs> and then we read the paper. Oh, 10,000 people died today. That's no good. Oh, oh this, boy. Okay. It sure was a tragic event. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's wonderful and strange. It's a great time capsule. What is it? iBells.com? iBells.com. Yeah. And my Twitter is Mr. Belzer. 
Yeah, there's so many gems on that website. So uh, our listeners should really you, go yeah. check check that stuff I'm out. Old, that's because I'm old. I have so many things in in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Gavin McLeod jokes and all kinds oh, of weird, everything. weird stuff now, on there. Wait a minute. Now, okay. Yes. So I could. I'm just talking to the audience now. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> now I I could go on talking to Richard for like this. This could be like for the for a, a year straight. A we'll, yeah, we'll, do, be, we'll do another one down the line. Yeah. Because listen, I, I'm going to be in New York in March. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm out of town that week. Oh shit. <laughs> Damn. Well, I could push my schedule. <laughs> Did I say March? I meant April. I'm going to be in April. <laughs> we'll do another one. All right. And because Richard, as we spoke about, I've known since I was a teenager. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and you at that time were 70. Well, I had yeah. started to gray. Your hair was starting to gray. I wasn't 70. I was punching 60 in the mouth. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So, so this has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. And we have been talking to my friend, uh, Richard Belzer, the it's great rabbi Richard, Richard Belzer. Rad- <laughs> <laughs> you remember you used to get up at the roast and you would oh you would do the rabbi. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Okay, great. Thank great you, season. Richard Bells. Happy holidays. I'll, be, I'll see you in the spring, Gil. Oh, in spring I'm gonna be touring. Yeah, all right. uh, mm. Sorry, I. Say hi to the kids. Oh, I will. Thank you, Richard.